want to live forever. From the quest for the Holy Grail through to the search for the fountain of eternal youth, human history and its mythology is littered with our obsession with youth and immortality. Today, amortality, if not immortality, is actually well within our grasp. An amortal is someone who lives agelessly, immortal, barring a violent accident. And right now, there are several scientific paths converging on amortality, indicating that aging is not inevitable and that it is, in fact, possible for us to prevent or even cure the aging process. Now, the first such method being explored is that of organic amortality, or curing aging by fixing our own internal biology. This method is big in Silicon Valley, where the likes of the PayPal Mafia, Singularity Universities, Peter Diamandis, and the founders of Google have all invested billions and billions in companies designed to keep their founders alive for longer. Now, one such organic immortality method being explored is that of CRISPR gene editing technology. Using this technology, biologists can now cut out the faulty genes responsible for aging and illness from human embryos before those embryos are even implanted for conception. Of course, this method won't help those of us already here, but we can turn instead to epigenetics or biohacking to fix the way our living genes behave. Now, epigenetics is just the study of how environmental factors switch our genes on or off and therefore affect our health. Biohacking is just, therefore, the DIY version of epigenetics. Using this, if you want to experiment with it yourself, you would just start to experiment with your body the same way a scientist would experiment with a subject in a laboratory. You'd monitor and track how factors like medication, meditation, sleep, caffeine, sugar, exercise, all those things affect your health, and then tweak and modify your behavior to optimize your health and vitality. Now, extreme fasts and calorie restriction diets show a lot of potential in the pursuit of immortality, and they're one such example of this sort of technology. If that just sounds like too much work for you, you can rather take your cue from Countess Elizabeth Bathroy. She is an infamous medieval countess who was most well known for murdering hundreds and hundreds of young women, true story, and bathing in their still warm blood in the belief that their youth and vitality would be transferred to her. Nowadays, though, scientists have found that elderly lab rats that get transfusions of young, healthy rat blood go on to live longer, healthier lives. And of course, scientists are now experimenting with human beings, too. There's a company in Silicon Valley called Ambrosia that's just completed a human clinical trial on young blood, and it's showing quite a lot of potential. Vampire facials, the likes of which have been popularized by the Kardashian sisters, where they withdraw your blood, spin the plasma around, and turn it into a personalized face cream, are another sort of evolution of the young blood route to immortality. Now, if you don't like blood or the thought of needles, it makes you feel a little bit squeamish, you probably won't like the second bio-organic route to immortality much either. This route, otherwise known as the cyborg route to immortality, involves integrating technology with our human flesh and blood bodies, things like microchips or any sort of robotic device. It might sound very, very creepy, but the truth is, if you have a hearing aid, a pacemaker, a hip replacement, knee replacement, or you just had plastic surgery and had some um, implants implanted, well, congratulations, you are already a cyborg. Today, though, technology is just allowing us to replace that many more faulty or flawed or just plain ugly body parts with superior synthetic bottles. We already have things like 3D printed arteries and organs, and we're even going to get to a point where we can start using thought-controlled prosthetic limbs that could, in fact, be superior to our organic body parts and give us superhuman strength, speed, or even superpowers like telepathy. Now, if this is all just getting a bit too much for you, the third route to immortality, the inorganic route to immortality, will allow you to leave your frail, increasingly expensive human body behind you altogether and rather upload your mind, potentially even your consciousness, into a computer to live on after you die. Now, MIT's Augmented Eternity product wants to take all your social media data, you know, all those likes and posts and comments that reveal your innermost secrets and opinions, and convert that into a chatbot that can live on after you die so your loved ones or just your employees can consult with you after you're gone. 
that might sound a little bit, oh, it's never going to happen in South Africa. But right here at Wits University, a gentleman by the name of Adam Pantanowitz and his colleagues at the Brain Internet Project have already figured out how to connect a human mind to the internet. They are now wanting to develop this technology to the point where our human brains can be connected to the cloud, just like a computer is today, to both send and receive information. Other scientists at the Open Worm Project created the first artificially intelligent life form. They did this by mapping the neurons of a little worm called C. elegans worm, and they developed this very complex computer program that now functions exactly like the worm would. They believe that they'll be able to do the same with all creatures, including humans, one day. Of course, it's going to be a lot more complicated with people. We have something like 86 billion neurons compared to the little worm who only has 302 neurons, and we're not even sure what consciousness is yet. But in theory, it is possible that one day we could live on eternally as an algorithm. And then, of course, if you do happen to die accidentally, you could consider having yourself cryogenically frozen instead. It's not cheap. At $20,000 plus a pop, it's not for everyone, but you do get a discount if they just freeze your severed head. No refunds or guarantees of it working, of course. Now, all this weird and wonderful technology can really be summed up by the transhumanism movement's manifesto, that we can and should eradicate human suffering and cure aging as a cause of death using whatever technology we have available to augment our minds and our bodies. In other words, this noble goal is to live long and prosper, just like they say on Star Trek. And so far, we are doing very, very well with the first part of that manifesto. If you're born today, across the world, our average lifespans are around about 80 years. That's up 30 years from a century ago. And if you make it to 80, you have a very good chance of making it all the way over 100, too. There are, in fact, 3.7 million members of the greatest generation still alive today. No millennials, sorry, I'm not talking about you, I know we're pretty awesome, but the greatest generation are the guys that lived through both world wars and are pushing 100 years today. In fact, the oldest woman on record was a lady by the name of Jeanne Clement of France, who died at the age of 122 in 97. And most scientists believe that 125 is really going to be where human natural lifespan start peaking off. However, longevity experts and extremists like Dr. Aubrey de Grey, who's also a TED fellow, believe that if we just apply our minds to curing aging using the technologies I've shared with you today, we could reach a thousand year human lifespans within a generation. So yes, we're doing very, very well with the first part of that transhumanist manifesto. But what about the second part, to live long and prosper? Is that possible? Or is it really rather a choice of live long or prosper? Now, in Greek mythology, the Greek goddess of the dawn, Eos, fell in love with a human. And she asked Zeus to make her mortal human lover immortal. She forgot, however, to ask that he was also granted eternal youth. Bad mistake. Living forever, like Dorian Gray, young and beautiful, fantastic. Being old and decrepit forever, not so much fun. Or take Daniel Kahneman's peak end rule. He's the Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist and psychologist. And he wrote about how our consciousness values any experience as the average between the peak intensity of that experience and the end point of that experience, and not by the duration thereof. In other words, the more the end of our life sucks, the less everything that's come before it matters. A shorter life is deemed to be more valuable than an otherwise identical life that just ended sooner before the bad end began. Is it any wonder then that suicides and euthanasia are on the up? There's now twice as many deaths from suicide as homicide on a global level. In the Netherlands, which is one of the first countries to legalize euthanasia, it now accounts for a full 4.5% of the deaths in that country. And that's even among young, healthy people. And this morbid trend really cries out for a discussion. Do we even want a longer life if we can get it? And what if people don't want you to stick around? If millennials are the sandwich generation who have to look after their children and their parents financially, the children of millennials, Generation Alpha, will grow up to become what I call the Dagwood generation. They're going to have to look after children, themselves, their parents, their grandparents, even their great-grandparents, as human lives breach the 100-year mark. And then there's that great saying in academia that says that ideas progress one funeral at a time. 
So what happens when bossy baby boomers stay in power for generation after generation? Research right now indicates that the last baby boomer will only leave us in the year 2088. That means we could feasibly have another 17 terms of Donald Trump as president of the free world. <laughs> so think about that for a second. And what about ageless dictators who refuse to give up their resources, to even put population control policies in place to prevent future generations from being born at all, like China did with its one-child policy? And not to mention, perfect longevity and prosperity for everyone would be hell on earth. We would completely decimate our already stretched natural resources. And sure, maybe we could run away to Mars to live on a space colony with Elon Musk and co. But I don't know about you, I wouldn't really relish the short thought of living a thousand year ageless life on a dust bowl colony in some dusty star. But all that said, I'm no deathist. If we can cure aging and end suffering, we absolutely should. We should give future generations that choice. I'm not questioning that. Rather, I'm asking you to question for yourself, is a longer life right for you? Take the 27 Club. This is the group of celebrities who all died at the age of 27. It includes Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse, Jimi Hendrix, and a whole lot more. Would their lives have been more happy or more successful if they'd lived longer? Probably not, judging by the fact that most of their deaths were of the self-inflicted variety. Perhaps people in the past have achieved more with thought shorter lives because they felt the impending sense of mortality more. I'm sure you all know we, most of us, need an alarm clock to get out of bed in the morning. And we all know the saying, the task expands according to the time allocated to it. More time usually means more procrastination, not more productivity. So if you were given a longer life, would you use it? Or would you maybe waste some of it? Even worse, would you even enjoy it? Or would you merely suffer through it, wishing for a long ago past when the world made sense? You know how old people are. Or dreaming about a far ahead future when everything will eventually become right. And what about that original manifesto I spoke about? The transhumanism goal to end human suffering. Many of the methods we can use in the pursuit of transhumanism involve no small amount of suffering themselves. I don't know about you, a 10-day drive fast doesn't sound like too much fun, and I'm not sure that giving up wine and chocolate for the rest of my life is worth the suffering and self-sacrifice that nutritionalists promise will give us a few extra days at the end of an already very long life. So perhaps if we do really want to eradicate suffering, perhaps the best, perhaps the only way would be to upload our minds into a matrix-like, unthinking, unfeeling computer simulation that can live on in bliss, but also without actually experiencing anything. So would that sort of end or life be any less suffering than actually growing old and dying as we know in the human experience right here today? Which brings me right back to that question that I opened with today. Do you want to live forever? Or do you want to live right here, right now, today? As science makes immortality a real possibility within our lifetimes, this is a question that many of us in this room will have to answer for ourselves.